Welcome back to the Real Femme Sapien YouTube channel where I give cultural commentary and I hunt down husbands and wives on the internet to interview them because I don't know if you've noticed, but marriage in America is broken. And we're going to get a lot of insights today from a husband who has been married for over 30 years and he has been with his wife for a total of 33 years. So we rarely get husbands on the channel and also... I don't think we've had a formal red pill husband either. So it's just going to be fun to banter, chit chat. You guys are welcome to ask questions in the chat along the way. Members, about halfway through the show, the chat's going to be closed to just you guys. So you can get in your exclusive questions as well. Because everyone wants to know, from the man's perspective, was marriage worth it? And I am excited to hear just because I enjoy this gentleman's uh, life story. So you can check out RP, RP Thor. He is tagged in the title as well. Make sure you give this video a big thumbs up. Subscribe down below and hit the notification bell. There are two products in the description down below for you guys. There is a biblical femininity course available to you by Bernadine Bluntly. She's been married for quite some time, has five children, and her husband delivered the last two by hand. So I just think she might know something the rest of us don't. There are also Belladonna candles linked in the description down below for you guys if you just want to get the women in your life a nice gift because women like candles. I think that this is something that we can stand firm in. I know the left is trying to take everything from women, but hopefully they don't take candles from women. Alrighty, so let's pull on RP Thor and let's have fun. Hello. Hey, Allie, how are you doing? I, I am congratulations good. on your success. It's been almost a year since we met. Oh, yes. I went viral um, because I listened to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were both in Miami at that time and we got to meet. I got to meet your husband and it was a really good time. And then to see you blow up has been a real pleasure of mine. It's quite refreshing to have you out there <laughs> in our space, so to speak. I know you're not particularly red pill, but you're very aware of the, yeah. the praxology, which is really refreshing to see. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say I'm red pill aware. Um, I just think I, I'm more on the gracious side, but I'm gracious Love with it. women and I'm gracious with men. And I think that that's something the red pill is just like, no, you know, the world's going to be cold hearted for you men. And I think that that's true, but your wife shouldn't be cold hearted for you. She should be giving you grace. So I'm just, I'm a yes. little bit soft with it for sure. I can say that. So uh, uh, that's one thing the red pill doesn't do well is we don't do that well with nuance. You know, and, and finesse, uh, black and white's easy to understand. And of course that gets views. So, you mm -hmm. know, there's a little bit of that as well out there. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Can you introduce yourself to sure. the people, let them know a little bit about what you do about yourself as well? Yeah, for sure. Uh, my real name is Thor. Uh, RP stands for whatever you want it to be. You know, it's not necessarily red pill. I'll tell you that it was just the fact that RP fits a lot of things. And when I was uh, asked to make a YouTube, Thor was taken because, well, you know, Marvel's Thor owns everything. Even though I was born a year before the actual Marvel Thor, I, you would think I'd have seniority rights on the name Thor, but no, not so much. But no, that's my real name. I'm, uh, I'm over 60. Uh, I've been married for over 30 years, been with my current wife for, well, 33 years. And, uh, you know, four children, 10 grandchildren, I think by the end of the next month, maybe 12. So, you know, we do have a bit of a legacy going on. So we've had our good times, our bad times. And how I got in this space is, is one of our, uh, one of our mutual friends, John MLD, was on Facebook under a pseudonym. I don't know if you, anybody knows that's Modern Life Dating John. Mm -hmm. And him and I were having a conversation. Uh, and he basically talked me into coming on to one of his shows. And then uh, he kind of interviewed me and then asked me to start teaching some of the classes that are, are doing lectures for men in the red pill space at the time or the manosphere. I ended up doing it for him and for uh, Myron and Walter, uh, Fresh and Fit a few other guys. And that's how I met everybody mm -hmm. is through that space and doing private uh, zoom lectures and video lectures on various topics, how to become durable, emotional mm -hmm. durability, which is emotional regulation, some stoicism and some other topics too, such as principles of long-term relationship success. And then my most popular one in the last couple of years is one that will be coming out this summer in, in book form, which will be titled a dominant masculine presence. Uh, I've been working on that one for two years, slightly delayed because of some personal issues that I had at home, but it, it is in editing right now. 
I just got a draft of the first chapter in audio from an actor. It, it sounds pretty good. I have to share that with you privately, but um, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. It's going to be kind of a guidebook to uh, creating at least a masculine presence for yourself as a man. And I think you'll be able to associate as a woman with what's actually attractive about masculinity for you. Mm -hmm. out of that. So that's how I kind of got into the YouTube space. I actually got into what we might classically call the red pill space in regards to the manosphere in 2013, December. I was, let's just say, had a little bit of trouble or mm -hmm. issues with my current relationship. It wasn't bad, but it was there. And I was trying to understand it. And the rational mail had come up. It just released. And I read it and it's, oh, great. I like the way he put it together. It's very, very good, very practical. Only a little bit of opinion in there. A lot of people take it way out of context, but mm -hmm. it really, it, it, there is some unflattering truths in there. But when you look at it from objective reality, it, it does fit the majority of, of what goes on between men and women. And it was, uh, I, and when I read it, I kind of went, God, there's somebody out there that's thinking very similar to me. And that's kind of where I started hearing, you know, some of these guys over the next four or five years, they really didn't do much until 2016. And then I think I picked up something again by, uh, mm -hmm. Rolo Tomasi. And, uh, of course, since then we become friends and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and have talked. But that's kind of my entry into it. It's just been slow, and I kind of got dragged into doing all this by John Emilty <laughs> and Donovan. Let's not forget Donovan. Shout out, Donovan. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes. He is the reason why I have a YouTube channel this large today, so shout out really? to him. Yeah, yeah. Um, he he found me somewhere a long time ago. I think I had less than 3,000 subscribers, something like that, um, and he put me on a panel with other women, so I think that was a really contributing factor, and then through his conference, I ended up meeting Pearl, accidentally went viral. <laughs> it was very uncomfortable because Pearl's asking me, she's she's very sociable and I wasn't used to that. So she just puts this camera in my face and is like, how did you get married? I'm like, um, well, I guess this is how I did it. And I wasn't planning on going mega viral, but hey, here we are a year later. So shout out to Donovan and Pearl. Um, actually, you know, I like Ryan Stone a lot and I talk about mm -hmm. his work publicly because he's one of the few guys that can help uh, men that are in long-term relationships. He can also help you just getting a woman too, because he, he keeps up with his field reports that he gets. But I do have to say, Thor, you're actually my favorite because I met you in real life and you've oh, got, thank you. yeah, yeah, you're welcome. But you Ryan's just interesting. A, I've never uh, met him personally, but I, I have to go back before all of this. I was lurking on Married Red Pill and the Red Pill where he's a moderator. So, I mean, he's he's legit for sure, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never said anything. I just lurked on those areas for entertainment. But, uh, you know, that was good. Yeah, I would I'm say glad. out of out of all of the guys, you're the warmest. Take that how you want. There's definitely a masculine way to be warm. But I was just like, oh, he's so kind. He's well-mannered, too. Uh, and that's just so rare. You seem very much genuinely yourself, which I think you would have to be, you know, with the 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 fashion vibe. I feel like you very much have to be secure, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my identity? Yeah, I do a lot of talking about that in my book as well. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. it's entitled a dominant masculine presence, but part of a presence is your character and the development of your character. Mm -hmm. Both men and women have these traits, but it's something that men take a lot longer to acquire, uh, mm -hmm. to be genuine and authentic. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it becomes like that, it just becomes second nature. People accept you immediately for it. And it can be attractive in any arena. Think of it this way. How do those K-pop young men get so attractive? Well, they're authentically that. And they there is a dominant masculine presence about it, even though they might not appear that way to others. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do talk about those sort of things. And I talk about having that dominant masculine presence means absolutely not domineering. And that means having finesse, understanding nuance in, in, in conversation particularly with women or with people that are a little bit more emotionally sensitive and the more emotional control you have, you don't engage in some of the more common uh, communications that men and women have today, where it's rather that mm -hmm. debate style. There's a lot of uh, fa logical fallacies that are used today. Mm -hmm. uh, there's political filters that people use. And then the predominant one that I see that you were even subject to when you had destiny on was uh, he's very good at sign language. And this is the common tactic. 
You got to tell the, the audience what sign language is. Okay, sign language is using shame, insults, even if they're backhanded, uh, uh, guilt, and then the extreme need, need to be right. Mm -hmm. So that's the debate style. And that's why the over talking sometimes and putting words in your mouth, that's the insult. That's the disrespect. Mm -hmm. So you said this, and you could see it everywhere. Oh, so what you're telling me is this, which is yeah. strong too. This mm -hmm. is actually kind of taught in our in our education system today as, mm -hmm. as complete communication from men to women. And, and I will argue every day that that style of open communication is actually destructive to relationships. You don't mm -hmm. have to be that way to understand somebody. You yeah. can need some finesse and understanding, but mm -hmm. it's very common and I see that's very common, but yeah. Yeah, guilt or, or sign language is very common amongst men and women today. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's kind of been a, an issue for me in socializing is because I don't want to have to engage in feminine warfare with men, but it's something that has continued to happen as our society gets more and more co-ed. Uh, and, you know, because I think that you expect more um, like cool, calm collectedness. And then you have a, a co-worker, they'll stab you in the back and start a rumor about you and then try to hit on you the following week. So you're like, this doesn't even make sense. So, yes, we live in uh, very gender confused yeah. times. Happy to hear that you and your wife are not gender confused. Thank you so much. So let's go down memory lane. Let's go. Right. <laughs> so how did you and your wife meet? When was that? Well, excellent, excellent question. And I'm not asked this too often, but I will definitely go there. I will also acknowledge that I was married once before. Mm -hmm. And, and just so you know, I had two children with her. And unfortunately, she had a lot of outside influence and she wanted a party. She was very young. And uh, so she basically decided to party. And I was left with a and the reason this is pertinent to how I met my current wife is she left me with a, a three year old and a five year old son. Mm -hmm. And she went into party phase, if, if I'm using the correct language that uh, some oh. of us manosphere, she did. And mm -hmm. she needed to, girls need to have fun, and she had missed out. And she was all of, I think, 24 when she decided to do this. Oh, um, so you, yeah. you got married really young back in the day. Well, she was younger than me. So, oh, okay, okay, okay. Late, late <laughs> yeah. 20. So, so there are risks when you, you pick the younger ones sometimes. If you don't do your vetting, I had none of that. There mm -hmm. was a, a lot of the issues that a lot of guys face. Guys, I will just put it this way. If you break up with somebody, let's not go into too much detail, but if you break up with somebody, don't get back together and not be protected. <laughs> You'll have to do the right thing. <laughs> let's just put it that way. But uh -huh. I'm actually very blessed because it taught me a lot of lessons. So um, I dated after that. And I found a, a young woman through uh, co-workers that I had set up a computer for. And living next to the co-worker was a young woman of 24, 25 that had two small children at the same age range as me. Mm -hmm. And so we chatted and we talked. And, you know, one of my big concerns with dating is unlike anything today, that you might find if you don't have children, I'm looking for a mother for the children as well as a mate for me. So it changed my screening process. I almost had to get rid of some of my more lustful desires and actually screen in a bit of a different fashion. And so, <laughs> well, I'll tell you this, my masculinity scared the hell out of her after two dates. And that was it for six months. We didn't see each other again. No, mm -hmm. no contact until she saw me at a public event with my children and I had a lot of female interest around me at this public event. And that kind of sparked an extreme interest in her. And after that, it was game on. Well, let's just say we ended up dancing and it was game on ever since, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I dated her non-exclusive for the next 18 months. And then we were married. Oh, that's beautiful. And okay. We mm -hmm. blended our family. Both of us had primary custody. And uh, we did not have children together. That was a choice. We both had our children. And oh. so we did kind of, we didn't really do the Brady Bunch thing, but one of the things that we did that's very different is we really had conversations about the children. We didn't move in together or anything like that. We introduced the children slowly because I think we we're both after similar outcomes. We knew that being, having a husband and a wife raising children was the best possible outcome. We believe that fully. Mm -hmm. And um, 
but we also knew we did that our relationship had to come first in order to successfully raise the children. Mm-hmm. It had to be number one and it had to be placed really above the children. I hear today a lot of singles saying my children come first. It's always my children. And it's true. Children will always come first. But if you're entering a relationship that you're going to make a covenant, that, that relationship, it really comes first. If you're going to have longevity in the relationship, mm-hmm. I've seen way too many people in my time, children grow up and they're gone and the couple has nothing left mm-hmm. or somebody's over invested in the children or living vicariously through the children. It's a big problem. And you mm-hmm. see a lot of great divorce at my age because mm-hmm. of issues just like that. But no, we ended up with a very good marriage for a long time, but don't think it's all roses. You know, we had, we had some issues too, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the, whatever ones you're comfortable sharing publicly. I mean, I've had adaptations myself and, you know, I, I gotta say, I do empathize with my husband because he was a 48 year old bachelor, obviously dated women on and off. I, I think he was one of those career guys that he was working so hard. He forgot to fall in love, which is great for me. You know, <laughs> great mm-hmm. for me showing up like young fit. It's awesome. Um, but you know, he went from being a bachelor to quickly being married and now we're expecting a baby and we're going to have that baby soon. And it's all happening within two years time. So there's been adjustments for him, certainly adjustments for me, but I happen to think it's fun. I, I enjoy being an age gap marriage. I get flamed for it a lot, but um, I'll I think tell- it's really good. Yeah. I, I, I think that's extremely healthy. Uh, mm-hmm. My wife is younger than me. And I I will, I know that this is going to be super controversial. Do you mind if I throw this out? Yeah. The trouble is with older women struggling with dating. Mm -hmm. And this is only my theory. I'm not done compiling this hypothesis yet. It's just observational. So take it with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. But I'm seeing that why a lot of uh, men that have come into their own in their mid thirties are interested in younger women is twofold. Not only are they fertile in there, that's what's most attractive to men set that aside but there's something about a woman that's younger that has more she's she she's more plastic when it comes to the relationship Mm -hmm. her attraction levels are high she hasn't formed all of their her um all of her desires haven't fully been ingrained yet and so she's somewhat plastic you might say more i hate to use the term moldable but she the women tend to mirror their husbands and it's for, for, for the better. They adopt his hobbies. They support what he does, especially if he's successful. They're proud of it. And those relationships seem to be really, really strong. I notice with the older gals, it's they're not quite as plastic anymore. Some of those things are already set. So it's a much more difficult challenge. I'm not saying it's impossible. Mm-hmm. You know, if the traction levels are high enough, anything's possible, mm-hmm. uh, you know, through conditioning and desire and willingness to put the work in. Mm-hmm. But I think that's a, another part of why men are so attracted to younger women outside mm-hmm. of the fertility part is that they're, they really mirror quite well, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, that, and I think we're fun. I think one of the funnest memories I have, <laughs> one of the funnest memories I have is, uh, do you remember R. Kelly's trapped in the closet, the series that he made? No. no, no. Okay. My audience does. Okay. You should, if you get bored, go ahead and look it up. But so I showed it to my husband uh, and he'd never seen it before. Obviously very big cultural differences. And I watched it with him and he was, bu- he just busted out laughing. So we get to exchange uh, different bits of pop culture together that kind of cross the ages that are just hysterical. Uh, and I, I love it, but I think I've also always been kind of an old soul. I don't like any music beyond the 1990s it's just a steep nosedive and and a lack of quality with that one um yeah yeah so right no metal metal for me well except uh what's this one (laughs) one by metallica i like that one but i also like the story behind it yeah yeah so um so you've been married a very long time congratulations to you guys what do you two think of marriage today because i think the laws might have been different when you got married could you expand on that as well Sure. Uh, I'll just use myself as an example. Realize it's just me and my experience. I generally don't like to talk like that. Uh, I like to be more empirical, but using my experience, when I was first married and I went through my first divorce, she uh, basically abandoned me. So it was really simple. I divided Mm -hmm. the community property, gave it to her. I had primary custody of children. I got away scot-free. The laws were still not very favorable to us. 
However, wanting to raise children the best that I could, being proud of my sons and actually enjoying her children and one of the, you know, really kind of adopting them is um, when we got together and we did our marriage, we took it in the ceremonial fashion, even though we later had it, we had it accepted by the state mm-hmm. for her to become a beneficiary and for us to form LLCs and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, we wouldn't do that today. But what we did different back then is uh, I wrote our I wrote our wedding vows. I did. I wrote them myself. Mm-hmm. That's very different. And so they were very personalized to us. When we were married, it was just me and her. And it was our young children. You saw one of those photos. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. I sent it to you. Yeah. So you didn't see the children. They were standing underneath us. That's how small they were. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was that was it. That was everybody that was at the wedding. So it was a very different type of commitment. It wasn't a celebration. The families didn't come together. This was for us. And that really unified our relationship above all the others, symbolically too. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that was a big thing to consider and not doing the commercialized wedding situation and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you ask her today, I guarantee she's going to say, no, we would not have a state marriage. Mm -hmm. We would do it differently. Even our finances would are a little be a little different than most people do. We have joint accounts, but we also have separate trusts and we have all these other things put together to protect each other and to protect us should one of us die or should one of us go feral mm-hmm. and uh, want to do something stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so that's already set. I know that sounds like it's a defeatist in nature, but you should, you know, a lot of people when they get married, Say, well, I'm burning the boats. It's all or nothing. That's a really bad plan in marriage. You mm-hmm. should be realistic and you should take a breath. Mm-hmm. And, and, and women should realize that marriage today for a man, they are lucky if a guy wants to have a long-term relationship with you. Marriage is really stacked against him when it comes to his future should you change your mind. And of course, every woman should have the right to change her mind. Every man should too. Mm-hmm. What is the ramification of it? That's that's where it comes to play. And so many marriages end and people get frustrated and they might embellish a little bit of the circumstances. And now there's domestic violence charges and there's all kinds of stuff that never goes away mm-hmm. and uh, hurts people for, mm-hmm. for a very long time. It hurts children. So I think marriage is kind of, I hate to say this, but I think we're kind of living in a post marriage, at least mm-hmm. a post state marriage world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. You're Obviously. Oh, <laughs> you oh no. Really, you got the state marriage, girl. I, I know. I'm very very lucky on my end. Uh, but I, I think also, oh, well, the, there were there was gonna supposed to be more documentation, but I guess Putin decided to make certain decisions. <laughs> and uh, my husband was in the military, so we ended up getting married very quickly, actually. So I had to get married within two days. So yeah. it was just preemptive planning because from his perspective he wanted to make sure that i was taken care of because he felt that i had invested enough in the relationship i suppose is my my understanding but he also um Mm -hmm. you know didn't have children of his own or anything like that or like an ex-wife or anything so i think that was just his decision which i am clearly grateful for so uh thanks for that but i also think benefits mm -hmm. legally or there used to be but i'm not so sure now but like military i mean having you designated i think there's two You, you can be Married spouse or domestic, right? And then you get mm-hmm. certain benefits. I I really don't yeah. know. Oh, you're talking yeah, about military? Yeah, I'm yeah. a dependent. I'm yes. Okay. So th- yeah, there's tons of benefits, but I, I had benefits from beforehand myself from serving as well. So okay. um, I'm just very fortunate because I could understand why men wouldn't want to get married today, but I just try to honor what he's given me, you know, be grateful, be worth the resources, be worth the risk because he is obviously at risk out there. So you just can't take this stuff for granted. And I I feel for these men, but I also wonder how they end up in those positions in the first place too. Now I've been told that women can act for a long time or they might change once the, once the divorce is filed. You know what I mean? That yeah, when you see divorce they, court, you don't think that that, that yeah. matches who you married. That is said often, but I will tell mm-hmm. you this. This is one of the, those uncomfortable truths. They're exactly who they are. They don't mm-hmm. change. There's a bit of a dualistic nature to mating when it comes to men and women. And men don't, men idealize their love for women. 
and they think that the woman is returning the same love that's idealized. And that's not the case. It really isn't. You need to be a little bit more objective about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same woman you're divorcing, even though she seems different. She seems very vindictive. You know, we really do a poor job of screening for long-term relationships. We, there, there's several characteristics. I do a lecture on this too. And mm -hmm. I'll go through some of those points if you want me to for details, just to give the audience an idea of what, what a guy should be looking for and what yeah. else should be offering. But go for it. You're a, you're a wealth of knowledge, you know, you've, you've been living a long time. So go ahead. But, but mm -hmm. uh, a, a, a lot of, a lot of folks today, especially men, I consult a lot of young men and even they want a long-term relationship. They don't want to be the player, even in the red pill space, mm -hmm. only about 10, maybe percent can be that guy, mm -hmm. you know? And even fewer can be Sterling Cooper and Jay Waller. So, you know, mm -hmm. both good friends of mine, by the way. So, but it, very few guys can do that. Most of them just want that girl they can call their own. Mm -hmm. And they over nice guy, they over invest and nobody needs that. That's destructive. But yeah, I, uh, I'll just give you a couple of them on screening. I mean, if you're out there and you're dating a gal and you want to get married, there's some simple things to go through. I, I go through a list of things that should be present after 12 to 18 months of dating. Everybody's get this high, heady uh, chemistry thing going on. It involves pheromones. It involves your hormones. It involves this wild, passionate lovemaking that's crazy heady. And you want to be with that person 100%. That's natural. It's what nature gave us in order to make us hit one of our two primary needs, which is survive and procreate. We need to do it because it's, it's, it's a challenge. And so we're rewarded with this. So after that wanes, what's left? The real person. Right. And I think that this happens to the girls too. The guys do this too. They're not real at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so listen, this is what I wrote for the men. Look, after 18 months, here's a couple of added values. Answer yes or no to these questions. Does she seem happy to see you after 18 months when you see her, right? Something as simple as that. Does she like being in your presence? Does she smile? Does she offer physical touch? I, I, this is going to sound so harsh, but please don't take it the wrong way. Have you ever owned a pet or a dog? Yeah. You're gone for a day and you show up. What does the dog act like when you get to the front door? Like they never thought they would see me again and they're just grateful. When you have a wife or a girlfriend that is jumping up and down and wants to jump on you, wrap her legs around you because you came home from a hard day's work, that guy's going to take a bullet for her. You know, I mean, it's just amazing to have that kind because now you have, it's real, it's authentic. So uh, does she listen to you when you're talking without interrupting or making rude comments? Does she refrain from put, putting you down or correcting your speech in front of others? This is real simple. I've mm -hmm. seen this amongst couples. The guy will be uh, talking to a clerk and then, you know, his partner always says, don't say it like this, say it like that. And it's in public. Those sort of things are really destructive and you probably have a personality conflict. You probably shouldn't be on an LTR. Mm -hmm. uh, is she polite and have manners? Does she enhance your life? Of course, I wrote this for men, but it can be the other way around too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is she proud of you? Admires you? Appreciates you? Uh, does she surprise you with acts of kindness? You'd be surprised how many men are so over invested in Mr. Nice Guys. There's really no acts of kindness coming back because they're taking it all up being super Mr. Nice Guy. Mm -hmm. uh, does she make it, does she make it a habit to think of you before herself? This mm -hmm. is some amazing wife stuff, right? Yeah. And I know because this is what happens to me. Does she care to know who you are, not just what you are. And does she support your personal growth? Because your growth, your success is actually her success. And when she recognizes that, that's huge. You probably want to take that girl and give her the vows. Uh, that's because she inherently knows that your success is her success too. And it'll leave a legacy. Uh, does she try to be feminine? Does she want to look nice for you? Yeah, of course. Um, does she make a learn, uh, her own self-learning a part of her own self-improvement uh, routines? You'd be surprised how many gals, you know, I am who I am. And you even see this with the, uh, uh, the fat acceptance movement. I just am who I am. And there's no efforts made. This mm -hmm. is not right for a human being. Every human being is on this journey. And this journey requires a certain burden performance, which you have to continuously improve, especially as you age. Yeah, you might be young and have it all. 
and everybody tells you you can do anything, but that is not reality. You must improve. So you can take these into account when all of that honeymoon phase is going. And this is the big one, Allie. Is she the influencer amongst her friends or family, or is she the influenced? This is huge if you want your relationship to last. Well, which one should she be? You got me on the edge of my seat here. She should be the influencer. Think about it. Mm -hmm. if, if you're a married woman and you're hanging out with a bunch of single gals your age, mm -hmm. do you think you might be influenced to not do things that would, you know, things that might not be the best mm -hmm. for your marriage? I, I completely agree. I think women are much more socially influenced than men for sure. Yeah. So, so those are some of the things. And if you're doing it properly as a guy, you're going to help her find new friends that she can really associate with that are couples that support you guys being together. Here's a really, really big one. Uh, does she look forward to having sex with you? Sex is a glue that holds it together. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a study I'm working on. I haven't completed it yet, but there's a study out there that actually was done across Asian parts of Europe. That says that couples that engage in frequent sex actually live on an average six years longer than couples that did not. And we're talking like an average of 3.7 times per week. So <laughs> I know it's just correlated, but I'll be doing an episode on that eventually. Just interesting to, to note as a side note. Mm -hmm. uh, does she not pester you with endless texts? Make sure she's not pestering you with endless texts and phone calls when you're out there bringing home the bacon, things like that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you want to look for. And of course, there's a whole list of added liabilities you want to screen for as well because if she's the person that's easily influenced by others you've got your hands cut you you, you got you got your work cut out for you mm -hmm. you know her girls might want to go on that puerto rico trip you know and they might all be married but they want to go to that puerto rico trip for a week for girls vacation out might not be the best idea mm -hmm. and you realize that it coincides with spring break and several events that are going on uh and another thing that I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, but does she think your relationship should be an equitable one? Mm -hmm. Oh, I've talked about this a couple of times. Um, so I, I say that men and women are equal in importance, but we're not equal in design. And the way that I break it down is that I want to be able to look up to my husband. It's just a lost element of romance, but it's, it's really not lost. If you look at the films that women will pay to watch that are romantic, the man is often someone that the woman can look up to because he's um, in, in higher higher positions and whatever his hierarchy would be his competence hierarchy so as, as much as women want to pretend this isn't true it is true aside from that if you want to look at some dark triad elements of masculinity that women seem to enjoy and fantasize about um 50 shades of gray outsold the bible people forget this so not to say that i'm in favor of all dark triad traits but it is nice to have a man that is capable of violence not because he would impart that on you but because he could protect you and that's another way that you can look up to your man because i'm five foot four i'm 120 well i was 127 pounds i am now uh, 140 pounds pregnant okay i can't protect okay. myself from nothing i could get beat down by a pill with a pillow by some random I love your man explanation. that's exactly <laughs> the point that i try to drive home but i have to simplify it for the guys when i yeah. do things like that you know and some of the other simple things is that you would ask as a liability, is she organized in her daily routine or is she a hoarder? These things will impact you in your after that honeymoon phase. Mm -hmm. That'll just kill you, you know? Uh, and then does she, when she's angry, does she tend to become contemptuous? Because contemptuous is a death nail. You know, if she tends to get contemptuous and you could tell with language and things like that. I have that. And then I also ask the guys a really hard question that they need to answer. Are they the more emotional or sentimental one in the relationship? Ooh, which one should she be? I would like you to think, which okay, one should okay. you be? I asked okay. the guys this question because mm -hmm. sometimes this really points out some of the issues with the guys. When we, we get into it in detail, we wouldn't be able to hear, but it's a good question to ask when you're trying mm -hmm. to get someone in a mindset, do I really need to go? I really want an LTR, but am I going to do the work? And then there's maintenance work after this. This is just the screening part that I add when they've already been dating for 12 months to 18 months and the honeymoon phase is over. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So I have, I have my answer. What's your answer? I think she should be the sentimental one. I know it. Yes, correct. And, okay. and the emotional one? 
Well, where, where she's gonna be. She's gonna. <laughs> you, that's not. You know. You don't really have to ask or say whether she should or should not be the emotional one. She will be. <laughs> yeah, there's no actual right or wrong answer here. It could be either way, as long as you're, you know, still a masculine stoic man mm -hmm. that has, you know, has it's, it, that's leading in the right direction. You could be. You can express some emotions as long as you're not expressing weakness and vulnerability. That's a big thing I go into too is vulnerability with men. That's a really mm -hmm. bad advice and then there's this other thing that i i don't know how many people will kill me for this on this channel but uh has there, there's this big popular thing right now that emotional availability it's the biggest crock out there mm -hmm. <laughs> you know if you're getting out of the house in the morning you're emotionally available there is no emotional unavailable if somebody's emotionally unavailable too it's just a fancy way to say they're not interested in you that's mm -hmm. it so I, I know a lot of people do that. And then that vulnerability thing, that's a whole nother issue. I have an episode that I did on that where I went into the actual roots of where it came from. And it came from Brene Brown's book back in 2010. I it's an knew absolutely it. insane uh, way of looking at mm -hmm. masculinity. It's, it's disagree completely. Yes. Well, I actually, I'm kind of over the Brene Brown hype train because I was a social <laughs> work major for a while and everybody loves her so much. And as a woman, I could understand it because some women are put in situations or have certain lives to where they feel like they can never really be vulnerable with a man, but that ends up putting a woman in her masculine, but not really because we're never going to be men. So you're essentially masquerading and pretending to be a defective man. And you just look like a woman that's completely out of sorts. So I like her content for that, but well, it's it, feel good words. It's feel good words. Mm -hmm. I will acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. So I just don't think that her content is all that beneficial for men. And I, when I see women wanting men to be more emotionally available, I honestly have come to the conclusion that it has to be the top 20% of men. It has to be because those are the guys that have options. Those are the guys that are more willing to ignore you. And my response to that is if you, if you go through the natural motions of a relationship where you have the long-term commitment, I obviously favor marriage. So hopefully you get the ring and then you go on to have children. The men will become what you would perceive as more emotionally available, but really he just understands everyone's feelings in the household more men understand emotions. This is um, something that gets misconstrued by feminists. If you offer a man compensation to identify emotions, he will perform just as well as a woman, if not more. I just don't think that men are conditioned to wear it matters that you're able to identify emotions. It mostly just matters that you guys produce results. And so if that's how your life is, then why would you spend the time to figure that out? But any man who's got children over the age of three, around three to four, they understand emotions perfectly. They just might handle them differently than a woman would. But that's the point is that he handles it a little bit different than he would as a mom. Because I think I'm going to be too soft. So I think my husband's going to have to be like more of the, the hard one, even though it crushes me inside. So Sure. So those are those are my thoughts on emotionally availability in men. I mean, That's you seem very well rounded of, of masculine mm -hmm. and the feminine. It really is. Um, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, I mean, we can have some amazing conversations. I'm a big believer in the triune brain. You know, the mammalian brain, the the reptilian or the limbic system, and then the frontal neocortex. It's very different than any other animal on the planet. And uh, the, that uh, limbic system is primarily responsible for emotional thinking and decision making, which is actually very, very fast. Mm -hmm. And this is very useful in our evolutionary past. You see, it's faster than going into the frontal neocortex where you're using rational thought, three dimensional thought, abstractions, mm -hmm. uh, which is really good for problem solving and tool use. And the emotional side is good. There's a bear run. You know, I'm scared. You, it's a kind of a little different. I'm not saying it's lower. It, it actually offers insight that rational thinking sometimes cannot, but the two don't really mix well when the communication's there and, you know, the, and then it's transmitted into the body through feelings, you know, feelings are in the body. Interesting mm -hmm. conversation. I love having that conversation, mm -hmm. particularly with young men, because they don't understand it. They being told they need to be emotional and they just end up being rather weak and that's not attractive. You've got to mm -hmm. give them the right path and the right rites of passage, mm -hmm. you know, to become yeah, well, when I hear women talking about you know, my man doesn't care about my feelings or I mean, first of all, is he even your man? Because my man cares about my feelings very, very much. Like, I don't know. 
<laughs> he cares about me. I can't relate. I'm sure you care about your wife's feelings. Um, okay. How about this? What are mm-hmm. some, what are some times where you, you, you do have to place a little bit less significance on her feelings because you know, she's just having a moment. How do you go about that? How do you know? Look, I'm not, I'm not completely hundred percent good at this because all her mm-hmm. feelings are not even know it. It's just the nature of the beast, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's what happens. But yeah, I do try to put her best interests mm-hmm. uh, in mind when I'm communicating. I don't always do that because I'm more of a rational thinker. Mm-hmm. And I, I do uh, exercise an emotional control. It served me extremely well. Uh, and that doesn't mean I suppress anything. I just understand how to control and then maybe feel later when it's mm-hmm. in, in my purview to do so. It's, it's more efficient for me. Mm-hmm. But as far as her, of course, uh, her emotions are in consideration a lot. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes I have to make the constant decision. She's not going to like this. And uh, this is the best. And I got to lead the way. And that's what leaders do. Transformational leaders will make decisions uh, in which they know they have to make decisions. That's not going to be popular. You're going to have to do this in the marriage quite a bit. Mm-hmm. It won't be the majority of the time, but you have to do that quite a bit. I know it's real popular to become the servant leader, but I will tell you this right now, that's essentially communism in your relationship. And it's not going to lead to the best place mm-hmm. because it ends up with the problem of the paradox of choice. You've got all these choices to make. None of them are the best and nobody gets to make a choice and they're confused on what to do. So arguments come up. So sometimes I just have to make a choice and say, yeah, she's going to have her feelings hurt here. Or she's going to be angry and mm-hmm. we'll deal with it later when the emotions go down. I'm trying to stay very generalized. So I hope that's making some kind of sense to you. It it should make sense. I I mean, the most self-aware women that I know, which also I would argue are probably more on the the intelligent side of things, they all identify as hyper-emotional, which Mm -hmm. means, in my opinion, I don't think they're hyper-emotional. I think that they're just women and they're aware of their nature because it's always usually the women that I would regard as hyper emotional and chaotic, they don't identify as hyper emotional at all. They think that they very much are not being swayed by their emotions, even though you can look and you can see with her behavior, how she's coming across. So I think that this is all just standard stuff. It's uncomfortable to talk about because we'll take it, I guess, and say women are emotional. Therefore they are less than, and we shouldn't take them seriously. And nobody's saying that we're just saying that women are different. You know, no, not at all. Mm-hmm. I think that's I think that's a common <laughs> it gets clicks for us to do that. And it mm-hmm. gets attention for us to say the emotional way of thinking is less or more. Uh, and both sides do this. Uh, feminism attaches to this. Modern media is all about emotional communication. It's very useful, particularly in conditioning and programming the human mind. But one thing that I really appreciate about being married to a very feminine woman who has these emotions is she has a depth of intuition based on those uh, on those emotions that I don't initially have very or even have rarely, uh, if at all. So what I'll do to kind of maintain that and make sure I'm just not always that stoic dude that's not ever concerned with emotions. It's not the case at all. There'll be many times where I'll, I'll give her a situation and say, "So tell me what is your what's your feeling on this? I always want to know what your feelings are on this." Yes. And let her let her let her cut loose because it will give me a perspective oftentimes that I've never thought of. Sometimes I don't do that enough. And then later on, she says, well, have you thought about this? I went, damn it. And I got to call that dude and tell him I'm sorry. Shit. <laughs> you know, I, I get it. You know, did you know you just told your coworker that? And I go, well, yeah, he's a man. It's like, well, you know, he's going to feel like that. I went, oh, I'm going to need him. Yeah, <laughs> I better back <laughs> off. So this is a huge, she is an asset that's irreplaceable in many, many ways. Now, I don't want to say irreplaceable. Everything is replaceable. Please understand (laughs) the best relationships. You need to understand all relationships are are temporary. And what that does is that makes you appreciate what you have right now, because believe me, if anybody knows, I know it could be taken away tomorrow at an instant. So I know the temporary nature of relationships and it makes you grateful and appreciate what you actually have in the moment. And we get so hung up on the littlest, silliest things that we carry for days, sometimes years. I, I, I've counseled couples and I'll get this thing. Do you remember back in 2012 when you did this at the kids recital? And the guy's like, I really don't remember. But boy, she remembered, you know, he lost a brownie point then. So, you know, it's better to be in the moment, realize that relationships are temporary and not hold any grudges. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know how I got there. You got me going, but with the emotion thing. So I no, I love it. No, I love all of this. I'm telling you, these these men care about our emotions, but the, <laughs> they'll also tell us they're like, "All right, sweetie, I know you're having a hard time. Um, we'll come back to this later." We have a two dollar donation to the platform. I think you would recognize this person. Oh, my master of arms. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there you go. The <laughs> we got a Thor's fan club out here. We're colleagues. I think you guys might work together. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. So we have a couple of other questions, but before I get into those, because I did not expect for this to be such a, a lovely conversation, um, how much time do we have you for? How much time do you want, Allie? Well, so we've been talking for 45 minutes, and I think I want to go to an hour and a half, maybe two hours, because you just have a lot to say. Good? Okay, cool. Um, now, we're just going to talk a little bit more about the the genders, because everybody seems gender confused, but being that you are... 60 and awesome (laughs) you might not be so what from your perspective is masculinity okay so let's just start with everybody's a bit confused today because of the media the upbringing our school system and let me just go back say 50 years and use a definition of masculinity and femininity as it as i was raised with i think this will clear up a lot because this comes with really no agenda and i'll just read from it Masculinity equals the qualities and attributes regarded as the characteristic of men or boys. And here's femininity, the qualities or attributes regarded as characteristics of women or girls. Now, the situation that we have today, Ali, is if you type into Google, what is the true meaning of femininity? This is your answer. I challenge your chat to go do this. It comes up and says, the quality or nature of the female sex. Wow, that's almost the identical definition of what I read from 50 years ago, right? Now do exactly the same thing and type into Google, what is the true definition of masculinity? Ah, something comes up different. It says masculinity, social expectations of being a man. It's subtle, but it's very different. What does that actually mean? It could mean anything. It could mean a man's a woman. It could mean... We're transformers. It could mean we're something other than that. Um, And it it goes on and on about roles and boys and politically even defines it as being constructed and defined socially, historically, and politically rather than being biologically driven. And it does not say that when you ask about true femininity. So that division was put purpose in there and it's curated on Google for a purpose. I personally think it's done because There's a lot of folks that believe in Malthusian theory, which is we're overpopulated. And this is a sure way to shut the population down is get men and women fighting with each other because they're definitely better together than apart. But, you know, masculinity and femininity as a whole is neither good or bad. I think it's more, my definition is their energy potentials and polarities that are applied to the real world by men and women to solve the two primary instinctual drivers for men and women. And that is what? Survival and procreation. So we come at it from two perspectives. Now, add Brafalt's law to that. So that, and Brafalt's law says that the female determines uh, the, um, the direction and the nature of the family and who gets to mate and who doesn't. So your most masculine toxic man is actually a product of female selection for the type of mate she wants. That is exactly where we're at. So, being a dominant masculine presence is exactly what was bred for for the last million years. Also, if you think about it, there's actually an opposite to a dominant masculine presence. What would that be? It would be a submissive feminine innocence. Men will kill over it. Men have fought wars over it. And it's just to, just to have that woman in his life. So, you know, it's an interesting concept and it, we're being driven by laws of nature that most of us seldom even understand or even understand how to make work in our favor. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the traits that uh, I have, when you look at, um, let's see, I had some of the traits down from the book, masculinity, if I was to define it as I define it as behaviors and traits, it's honor, strength, self-discipline, mastery, ownership, conquest, emotional regulation, foresight, leadership, provisioning and security, respect, ambition, pride, competitiveness, risk-taking, stoicism, mystery, compassion, and passion. 
those fit within masculinity for sure. Um, so it's, it's ultimately the characteristics of males, of boys, and then men mature into that masculinity and it makes them quite attractive. It also makes them successful. It allows them to compete as well. It also can lead them to extremely harsh, harsh decisions. It all comes from our desire to perpetuate the species. Mm -hmm. A little long-winded. <laughs> no, no, I think it's really good, really helpful. Um, let's see you take a stab at femininity. I know it's a little bit different when men define it versus mm -hmm. when women define it, but I find that I have to talk to, in order to get a comprehensive definition of femininity, I have mm -hmm. to talk to a woman who's been married a very long time, over, I want to say, 15 years, who is also on the other side of the wall, has children and has a, you know, an, an appreciation for being a grandmother at some point in time as well. Those are the only mm -hmm. women I can get good definitions from because young women really, it's a vibe. <laughs> um, I mostly get my, my draws of femininity, masculinity, and I have a hard time defining it. And I often don't even want to, because it's usually mm -hmm. the left that's asking me to define it. And when they're doing that, it's because they want to find a hole in the definition. Because to me, I can look at it and I can see it. I can see it in my grandmother and I can see it in my grandfather. And it just goes without saying. But this stuff, as much as we want to say that it's social constructivist, it crosses all religions, all cultures through all time. It has essentially always existed, even when we lived in communal groups as humans. So yeah. even though the left is going to pretend that we've created these things, you do have to ask yourself, why does it exist in Eastern culture? Because in Japan, they have non-gendered uh, religions. They have a Buddhism, but predominantly they have Shintoism, right? But still, yeah. the men and women are masculine and feminine. Japan is a war-fighting nation. And then over here, I want to say, we'll call it the West. We have uh, a culture that is predicated on Abrahamic faiths, primarily yeah. Christianity. So you're going to get masculinity and femininity as defined in our culture in, from the Bible, Right. But again, we're just making these things up. So those are the only women I can get really good concrete definitions from as women that have been married a long time, have children and have an appreciation to be a grandmother if they're not already. So what do you think femininity is? OK, so let's do it a little bit differently. I know I had used the term a, um, you know, a submissive feminine innocence. So <laughs> innocence is a big part. It's very attractive to us men as far as protection. Uh, and security. It's the same reason, you know, children bring that out in us too. It's also the reason you, you brought up, uh, what was it? Neotonism in, uh, yeah. earlier in our, before we went on the air and that's mm -hmm. built into us. We have to protect the species and that's what makes women with their physical characteristics so attractive to us as well. But, uh, and there is, there is physical characteristics that also fall into feminine, uh, the femininity territory. But, uh, so let's just talk about it in a different way. I will define it as a woman who has modesty. That means that, you know, she is slight. It also, I will I'll define it as demureness. Does anybody know what demure is? You know, it's, a, it, you might use it. I mean, they say it's, the, it's well-behaved. It's quiet. It's respectful. Um, but I find it is very appealing in the fact that she's sweet. Part of it is being demure also means sweet, reserved, modest, all of those sort of things seem to fit femininity really well as well. Also nurturing, um, understanding, emotional understanding comes with femininity. I think that's important as well. Um, that's some of the things that I would throw out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an inherent a trust. We always tend to inherently trust a woman as not as threatening as a man. So definitely that's where that demure comes in, non-threatening as part of femininity. Also self-care. Women that are highly feminine have an extreme amount of self-care, which shows discipline and ability. You know, they're going to be able to care for children. That's why mm -hmm. men screen that way too. Uh, so it's physical, it's mental, and it's emotional is femininity. Um I think it's been very much bastardized by the modern feminist movement to become mm -hmm. more masculine. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with having honor with women or having some of those traits. It's just expressed differently when you think about it. You mm -hmm. know, women express, they express strength differently, emotional strength, right? 
Uh, Self-discipline can be expressed similarly, but mastery is expressed differently with women too. They have a really interesting way of writing that reaches further than some men. Uh, when it comes to conquest, women don't openly have warfare. They're very good at you know, subcommunication, manipulation, They're, that's a feminine trait. Sure it is, you know. I know. I could go on and on, you know. <laughs> An intersexual competition amongst women is fierce. You just talked about mate poaching earlier. That's more common with women than it is men. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is to poach your, poach your girlfriend's uh, husband because she's already vetted him and he's a good catch. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to watch out for that. <laughs> girl wanting, to your, wanting to poach your uh, poach your husband you know that mm -hmm. seems to be a part of femininity too neither good mm -hmm. nor bad um just some of those things you know yeah no i think you did i think you did an excellent job thank you very much so let me ask you some of these following questions mm -hmm. what are some of your favorite feminine qualities in your wife oh the fact that she's hypergamist Oh, do tell. That's interesting. You never hear that one. <laughs> <laughs> See, once you get past the red pill anger and you understand hypergamy for what it is, it always seeks a higher level, right? It seeks short-term mating opportunities and the long-term opportunities, right? The Chad, the Chad Lays, the Brad Pace sort of situation. Mm -hmm. And that's a quality that's inbuilt and it's a survival instinct. I absolutely honor that in the women because here's what it does for me. Not only does it keep me at my very best, it actually forces me to fulfill my burden of performance. Because if I don't, and I've lived through it, if you become unattractive, you have about 18 months on the clock, even with the best girls, the best women, the most feminine women, you got about 18 months. She's on a time clock, whether she admits it or not. Especially you understand about the wall and all of those sort of fertile things. She's on a time clock. If you can't keep up and fulfill that burden of performance, she's going to punch the next card for the next beta orbiter out there, whoever else is next qualified that she might see better than you. So I like the fact that it forces me to get up in the morning and be the best and to be, you know, at 60 year old still performing like a 30 year old, you know. That forces me that because I want her to be attracted to me, but I also recognize she can say, I'll be attracted to you forever and ever and ever. I promise, I promise, I promise. And that's a beautiful thing. But one of the things about femininity and, and the females is they can hold this concept here and they can have this concept here and they can be in complete opposite, opposite to each other. And they can hold them both together at the same time. She means she's going to be there, but you know, also if you don't do your part, I'm going to be gone. It, mm -hmm. it, it's not in conflict with her at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. So yeah, mm -hmm. I like that fact about her, that she's going to keep me on her toes, keep mm -hmm. me on my toes. I, guess Ooh, I like that. So what do you think, or what has your wife told you about her favorite qualities in you that are masculine? Say that again. Mm -hmm. If you had to guess, or if you had to explain, what do you think are your wife's favorite masculine qualities in you? Mm, I would say it's, it's, it's all, it's her favorite and probably not her favorite, both in the same time. It's so ironic that you say this. I said she could hold both those concepts mm -hmm. and that is my uh, emotional control, my emotional durability. It suits her well when necessary and I can weather any of those storms, but then I also she will want me to feel or behave a little bit differently in certain circumstances. And it, it's a hard transition. So she would say that's the best. And, and also probably her least is that I'm not feeling when I should be feeling. I think that's completely normal actually. Um, but that's, that's one of the qualities she finds. Also uh, I think that now that we're together, obviously she was very attracted physically to me and uh she one of the qualities she probably finds in me is that uh, there's socially there's a um, in our social group there's a lot of men that want to accomplish what I've accomplished so they they do mm -hmm. kind of honor me in some ways it's hard to say but she finds that very attractive as well mm -hmm. yeah well what all have you accomplished because you are an impressive man but we we didn't tell the people your resume do you want to tell them your resume well, well we can be brief I mean. Mm -hmm. 
done a lot of things, but primarily I became a electrical power lineman early, early in my life. I graduated high school at 16, went to Europe for three months. I got to experience a little bit of life, came back, went to work right away, ended up being a German power lineman. And I worked on the grid, maintaining all the electricity to everybody. Uh, so you can all have your TV, your net, and all that sort of stuff. I've flown, flown on helicopters. I've worn steel suits, climbed out on half a million volt lines, three, 400 feet in the air in all weather conditions. And I've taught men to do this. I tried to stay in shape like that. I spent eight years doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu in the 90s, earned a purple belt. I mean, there's all kinds of things that I, I have done. Uh, <laughs> sometimes that's a bit of contention with the wife, too, is I tend to go all in on things. And she's a supporter, but then she wants her attention, too. So it's a balancing act. I just tell her, just shut up, sit down. I'm going to do this. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, so I've done that. I, I got burned by 12,000 volts. I've had to have 14 reconstructions on my hands and face uh, because of my injury, but I was able to rec fully recover. And in that recovery, I learned how to draw and paint. And through that, I've drawn and painted power linemen across the country and started a web business in 1999 that did extremely well. And it only closed when she got in her car accident and became a quadriplegic couldn't keep that web business up and it allowed us to become real estate investors. So we're able to do that as well. So that opened up a lot of doors. So we've had several mm -hmm. careers in the middle there, somewhere in the two thousands, I became a PMP. I went back to school, got my degree and I became a project management professional. And I did that for five years and realized I really didn't like that. I just wanted to get back out and, and work with a bunch of guys. So I kind of went backwards on that, did that for a while. And then I still do that today. I work with a bunch of power linemen and still do that uh, today, as well as I kind of got sucked into this uh, space. And, and now it's become a part of my social life and I enjoy it. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of a way to pay it forward. Mm -hmm. now, that's just briefly some of the things that I've been involved in and soon to be an author. So that's been really difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, personally, I hope you uh, stick around because I think you should have a, a late night relationship call in show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, think, yeah. you're not the only one to say that. I, I've had some clients say that mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's the voice and the vibe, right? Because who who do we have? The male, the male led relationship call in shows, I, I don't think they're as smooth as you. You know, Kevin Samuels was smooth. I feel like you could also be smooth in your own way. I would love to see it. So hopefully you stick around. Um, I think you could help a lot of women out. Now, I know that's not your bread and butter, but <laughs> we could call and we could call and be like, he breathed differently. What do you think that meant? <laughs> so yeah, how did you... I, could, I could switch into my lower voice. How about that, girl? <laughs> I, I could put on the dirty talk boys and want some of that. <laughs> oh, no, not, not me. Your, your female <laughs> no, callers, the girls, baby. The girls, no, right, I know. Right, right, I know. Right. You get hit up by a bunch of these uh, sub 24 year olds and oh, then we'll no, anger no. the feminists. <laughs> It'll all be 55 year old gals that need a little help. Great divorce, right? Oh, ah, exactly. there you go. There you go. Probably. Um, let's see. How have you stayed humble? Because that is an impressive resume. I mean, you have to know that. I'm not humble at all. I, I would say I'm more modest than humble. I think, okay. I think being humble is a, a stupid thing. Mm -hmm. I, I will, I will, if somebody discovers my accomplishments, that's great. I just, if you ask, I might tell you, I might not, I, I won't tell you everything you got to discover on your own. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not going to be a humble guy. I think that the male ego needs, it needs to self fuel. And I hate to say that because it's not socially correct to not say I'm humble, but I would say I'm more modest than humble. There is a difference. So, you know, society asks us, we need to be humble. It's like, no, you can pound sand. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, but I'm not going to advertise it. You can discover it if you want, but I'm not going to self grandstand and, and show my accomplishment and say, oh, I'm so humble. I'm not, I don't do that. You know, I don't like that term. I just don't like it. I like that. That should be encouraging to a lot of the men watching. At least I hope it is. Okay. So let's ask you this question. What is one thing you wish you knew as a new husband? I know you were married, you know, uh, twice, but you, there's probably something that you do wish you knew along the way that you found out in your journey in marriage. Two things. Mm -hmm. The first thing is the cardinal rule. 
he who has the most power in their relationship needs the other the least. That's a hard, mm -hmm. cold truth that you need to understand going into a marriage. Mm -hmm. It'll keep you straight. The second thing is understanding the cyclical nature of, of, of uh, female hypergony and the phases that she tends to go through in her life. That's probably one of the best things that came out of this space. It is general. Not all women are like that. But then again, all women are like that to some degree, just mm -hmm. like all men are masculine to some degree, regardless of what they say. So those are useful tools to you to understand that. I, I can't tell you how many guys that I'll talk to and say, I just don't understand it. Everything was fantastic, Allie. I did everything right. I did the flowers. I did the Valentine's Day. I did what she said. All of this. I got kicked out of my house. I don't understand it. I did everything right. Mm -hmm. Listen, kid, you didn't maintain your attraction. There wasn't that underlying set of dread that kept her interested in you, which we'll save that for another conversation. That's more of the hardcore <laughs> red pill stuff. That's often overblown, but mm -hmm. it is reality. You have to maintain these relationships. There's a really big part of when I talk about principles of a long-term relationship is how do you do that with finesse, with grace, and uh, it's when I do this, I typically talk to men because women don't want to hear what I have to say. They really don't. They want mm -hmm. to play the game. And when you play the game, they're willing participants. But if you tell them how it works, they're going to go, oh, I don't like that. And rightly so, because sometimes the inner the inside is kind of messy and gooey and you don't really want to see that. But the outside's cool. So. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, I guess that's it. Mm hmm. I agree with that. I feel like girls just want to have fun. I'm, I'm weird, though. I want to know how the game is played, but that's just because I'm a nerd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? They're, mm -hmm. they're all I, I have. I know girls like that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know women like that. And there's some in our space. And it's really cool. Uh, they want to know. But I think when it comes to your own personal life, sometimes you just want the game to be played when it's just you and Tom, you and yeah. your husband. Yeah. You just want to play. You, you don't need to know why he's thinking or why he's doing these or, or those things. You, you might have an underlying knowledge, but you just want to play. You want to have that work. Yeah, I think I like analyzing other people's romantic lives, but I don't think I like analyzing mine. And for mine, I just want to chill and relax, you know. <laughs> Isn't that the biggest issue with us in this space mm -hmm. when people actually have conversations? I can talk generally about something immediately. And depending, uh, most people... Many people, when we're talking about an issue in general, immediately think you're talking about them personally. Mm -hmm. so I could say, you know, in general, women do this. And you go, I don't do this. You hear this constantly. It's always shaped through the filter of me and my experience. Uh, yeah. and, and, and it's so hard to let go of and look a little bit broader. So when it comes to what I, what I needed to know before I got married, mm -hmm. I kind of half knew those things. But I would like to have a much deeper knowledge of that moving mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't, it didn't have that much impact on me until much later in life after the children had gone out of the house for like five years. Mm -hmm. That's when I had gotten ill and I reduced my salary by choice to get better. And I became unattractive and hypergamy came to visit me. Mm -hmm. So another story for another time. Yeah, I know. I know. This is so fun. <laughs> you would have a good men's show too, but then you, you would talk about, um, all of the the not PG things <laughs> okay. behind the paywall. <laughs> I know, right? I think we can start kind of moving into fatherhood now because I think that that is something that's often neglected um, in the red pill space. But there's reasons for that. It's a at the bare minimum or at the bare bones, the red pill is supposed to be a man's a sexual mating strategy. And I don't think that fatherhood has much to do with that unless you want to look cool on a dating profile or something like that. Or if you're dealing with a gentleman who has children or might, might be trying to pursue a woman who has children as well. So, um, so I can, I, I can give grace because women want to complain about literally everything. They want to look at the red pill and be like, why are, why haven't you fixed all the men? And we want to be dating the best ones, but we don't want to put in the work work for the best ones why have you guys not fixed men i think it's dumb so so well, we've all done that in the red pill space us guys too are big oh, yeah? complaints. i have a saturday panel show that's just a bunch of old guys tongue-in-cheek complaining but we try to be funny about it because mm -hmm. that's what we do right <laughs> all of us do it's kind of letting off i think it's a safety valve but yeah. uh you know i do view the red pill differently than almost everybody in this space i i view it Honestly, I've had conversation with Rolo. I view it very much like he does in that it is the study of human inter 
sexual dynamics and to some degree intrasexual dynamics in how we behave. That is believing that all behavior is intentional and it's evolutionarily driven. And I look at it from that aspect, not so much that it's about dating and relationships, because I just find it interesting because behavior in other people is interesting. That's why you like analyzing it. It is interesting. How do I fit that puzzle? Why did they do that? I don't know why they did that. Let's find out. I like that too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but I think this space has become that because there is a crisis mm -hmm. in men and women's ability to communicate and connect. And that's, you were seeing that in the dating circles. And, and here's the thing. I mean, Red pill guys and gals say, well, look at what's going on. It's there's something different has happened, Allie, because it's only 10% of the guys getting with all the girls and there it's just the expectations are crazy. I think it's always been that way. Mm -hmm. I think we're just because of the advent of real time communication and access to a global sexual marketplace. We're just seeing what's actually always been there. Mm -hmm. And I think there's evidence for that. You just look at how many men have actually procreated enough to move their genetic legacy forward and it's it's like 98 97 percent of all women have mm -hmm. men it's in the low 60s or even the upper 50s yes to to a degree i don't necessarily feel bad for the for the men or the women at a certain <laughs> point in time when it comes to being single because if you talk to someone who's over the age of 30 and hasn't had relationships that have been you know solid at all yeah, at least a boyfriend or a girlfriend for one to two years, at least that but you look at them and you realize once you start talking a little bit more, you are the source of your own problem. You, to you definitely are. I see it on the women's side. I see it on the men's side. And uh, the other thing is too, is that reproduction has always been really challenging. And it's not just been challenging um, for men. It's been challenging for women in the fertility arena. However, in the Neolithic only one in 17 men reproduced. So it's been way worse. <laughs> it has been worse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in terms of fatherhood, what is one thing you wish you knew as a new dad? One thing I wish I knew as a new dad. Wow. Nothing really surprised me. I had brothers and sisters and I had mm -hmm. brothers of a younger age. And I had a sister that was 10 years younger than me. Um, I wish I knew how to cook better. <laughs> That's uh, a fair answer. That I mean, could be it, you know? I mean, yeah, I wish I knew how to cook better and, and take care of things for them. Um, you know, to be perfectly, frankly honest, when my children were very young, I worked a lot. And I, and I would say, you know, as a, as a, a new father, I would have liked to have more time, but in retrospect, this is really where men and women come together well is I was able to go out early in life and make an incredibly large sum of money mm -hmm. and provide a lot of things that we wouldn't have otherwise had that did benefit those children in the long run. So, um, yes, I wanted to be present more, but it wasn't necessary to the benefit of their, their raising or their outcome. Uh, in my particular profession, I couldn't go to all the basketball games. I couldn't go to every single event, but the one that made me much more focused on the ones that I could go to. And when I was able to coach them, I was more in, involved. And uh, it also, it allowed me to show, so show my children by example, how to be a provider and how to socially move as well. You know, I wasn't always with them. Uh, kids demand a lot of attention. I wish I would have known that, uh, but I was okay with it. I mean, there's nothing that really stands out that I wish I knew before I was a father. I think in retrospect, it did change me, but for the better, because mm -hmm. as soon as a guy becomes a father, that's never been a father before. And you definitely have that child for the next, I mean, the women, pregnant women, your woman's pregnant. She becomes even more sexy. She glows. And then she's holding this child of yours. There are changes in a man that happen. He becomes very protective, very territorial. And here's the thing. It becomes very fulfilling. And men don't experience that much. Uh, and when you have those children and you got, dad, dad, look at this, look at this. And you're seeing it for the first time. It changes your, your perspective once again for the better. That's your legacy moving forward. So mm -hmm. a lot of young guys that don't have children don't know that. And I, I'm just very thankful that I had my children when I did because they're all grown adults now and I have so many grandchildren. That's a nice thing. It doesn't really matter though. 
what age you have children, it'll change you. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think it changes you for the better. It gives you a lot of perspective. Mm-hmm. That's the one thing I didn't know is how it would change me. Mm-hmm. I love it. <laughs> I mean, for yeah, for me you, as a wife. Already changed. Oh, yeah. As soon as you became pregnant. Mm-hmm. Well, I think once once I started showing a lot more, I just immediately saw this behavioral change in my husband. And it was more of that, what you were saying, that protective, mm-hmm. that warmer side of masculinity. I was like, I am here for this. Can we make this last forever? <laughs> um, but I think a lot of women who are happy with the men that they chose to marry and reproduce with, they share similar sentiments. And that's a part of that masculine male stigma that women... Uh, what is it perpetuate between one another on the feminist side of things that oh all men are trash they're just the worst no 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 no. there's women out there that are very happy with the men that they've selected and they really enjoy that side of fatherhood but i think with the amount of childlessness that we have and the amount of singleness that we have among women there's no way you would know it unless you got the opportunity to experience it So hopefully we get some women out there in these uh, long-term relationships, hopefully married and out here having some babies as well. Um, I wanted to ask you, I don't know if you would like one more than the other. They might be the same because I've heard that as a response as well. Do you like being a father more? Do you like being a grandfather more? Well, I don't see it as a lot different. I love being a father. And uh, it's become such a part of my life that I've become a mentor to many men that span all age categories. Uh, It started when I started training younger men, not only my children, but when they started to become teenagers and adults and they went off on their own careers, I started teaching men of their age how to become power linemen and stay safe and not kill themselves or their, or their partners. Mm -hmm. And I found that through training them how to be this skilled trade I enjoyed it. And then I found that uh, probably 30% of what I was imparting to them was life skills, not the skills to become this power lima, but skills they could use in their life. Like how, how do I handle my relationship? What do I do when I can't be at every basketball game and every uh, school event? What do I do? I'm being guilted into that. And I said, there's no reason to be guilted. You're doing exactly what you need to do to provide for your family. That's actually more respectable than someone that lives paycheck to paycheck, but are every single you know, a softball event. And then what happens when they miss one, one month's rent? Now they're getting foreclosed on how long do you think the wife's going to stick around for that? How many more basketball games did they get to go to because Mm -hmm. he stuck to every one and sacrificed his ability to provide. So, you know, there's, there was a lot of of things like that. And I got really used to doing that. And that's kind of what also attracted me to this space is there was a lot of folks that wanted to hear some of the things that Mm -hmm. I'd been through and what some of the, the men, uh, in the space had come to me for. So I kind of, mm-hmm. kind of like being a father, I guess would be okay. lean, but I don't really see it as different. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it being a grandfather, I mean, that's, that's great, but I'm not their father. I imparted my knowledge onto my children and have their own fathers. Mm-hmm. So I like being a father, but I also liked putting all of my children out there to survive on their own and giving them all the tools to be successful. Mm -hmm. independently of me that's ultimately my my goal Mm -hmm. is to be able to do that Mm -hmm. interesting you know you'll find uh, that's one thing that missy did struggle with a little bit was a few years after the kids were all gone she had some empty nest issues Mm -hmm. because even though we had agreements there was still she was still on full mom mode but they were out being adults and so a little bit of that you'd ask her now it's like oh that was silly i shouldn't have been like that but um there is that you know, and and of course you're going to find out, you're going to find out with your child, you're going to be the one that says, Oh, everything's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. And sometimes you just need to let your child cry a little bit. They need to have some struggles in order to problem solve and be able to help themselves. And that's what you want. You want them to be able to help themselves deal with their emotions, learn to be, learn how to uh, accomplish things on their own. And you do this slowly over time. Of course, you don't start immediately, but you do this slowly over time until they really don't need you anymore. Mm -hmm. And that sounds harsh, but that's what you want to do with your children. So I think I like being a father better, you know, and equipping my children than being a grandfather. Although I love being a grandfather too. I just don't have the same level of interaction because they have their own fathers. Mm -hmm. Well, I bet it's the authority thing. (laughs) 
<laughs> I bet that's the that's the difference. So what would you say is your favorite thing about being a father? I think I know the answer, but I want to see what you say because I've just been listening to you talk. Well, it's it, it of course it's it's the legacy, it's the pride in the children being uh, I got them to adulthood, they're alive. <laughs> there were no teenage pregnancies. Oh, <laughs> they have their own that. families now, they're all successful. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was being able to impart my knowledge to them like my father did to me. I mean, when you got a father named Odin, I mean, you got to, you know, pay it forward. <laughs> He wasn't really named Odin, but he oh, you were my, my name really is Thor, but no, his name wasn't Odin. Mm. Um, but um, he was a good dad, and uh, you know, just the the thrill of being a father and seeing uh, the world through brand new eyes. Because you do tend to get jaded, and you tend to filter a lot out with age. And then here's this innocent person seeing life and the newness of everything around them and learning it for the first time. It's a thrill. So. I like that. And I think a lot of guys really, truly want that. They want to be fathers and they want to have a family. And, and actually, family life can be extremely fulfilling mm -hmm. and extremely rewarding. Unfortunately, the consequences of an unsuccessful marriage are so severe now, you know, and we've mm -hmm. got this big trend that moms are just as good as dads. So why even have the dad involved? That is detrimental to the child because they need to have some strong masculine influence in their life. I mean, it's been said many times that, you know, a strong masculine father keeps young men out of prison and keeps the girls off the stripper poles. So what can it's you say? True. It's true. Shoot. I'm, that's what I'm terrified of. I went to California. I met some 18 uh, year olds. <laughs> there were too many on OnlyFans. I was so stressed because, you know, oh, oh, you went and saw Brian Atlas. Yes. Well, <laughs> At least in the past, you had to drive to be on a stripper pole. You had to get in your car, get somewhere. Now, Everywhere. you could just be on the stripper pole on your phone. This is terrifying yeah. times. Good grief, Charlie Brown. But I, I digress. Uh, I am I'm confident in my abilities. So, so what do you think? What do you think my favorite part of being a father would be? Just the mentorship. But you, you went into so much more than that. Because I mean, I find it is so much more than that, though. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. you know well you and my it, husband are similar in that way so that's why i pulled that out because he just loves teaching and i would say he loves teaching men but i think he would also love teaching women as well in terms of having a daughter mm -hmm. i have a daughter and i love teaching women mm -hmm. in every way it's 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 a different way to teach it's a little less harsh when i say harsh men do need pushback boys need pushback men need pushback they tend to learn things the hard way. Have you ever heard someone, oh, I learned by the school of hard knocks. There's a reason. Mm -hmm. And it, a lot of it has to do with our uh, our innate drive to be competitive, to conquer, all those sort of things. And then we also have egos that tend to say we're superior, which it, it serves a purpose of survival. And so even when we're hearing words from our elders, and you can see this in society today, every generation that comes up thinks they have it. They're way smarter than the previous generation. Mm -hmm. They just do. And they try to change everything. And then they find out, oh, shit, they were actually really smart. <laughs> they figured it out way before us. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, I, I, I love having women involved. And uh, I've actually had some some female clients and uh, some of them that were, you know, in their late 30s that were struggling. I also used to. <laughs> one of the reasons I got in this space, not to sidetrack, but I taught NPC bikini competitors. Do you what is, what is that? Thing? Bodybuilding? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, you I, are real buff. I'm, I'm kind of out of shape right now, but I did. And super interesting because it gave me a lot of insight on female behavior and mm -hmm. the need for attention. It's amazing. And uh, if, if you can figure that out and, and, and understand that and not be in such a need, most men are in such a need of thirst. They have such a lack of sexual fulfillment be it porn, be it whatever, or even lack of female attention that mm -hmm. they just act freaking stupid around women. And if you can get past that, it's really amazing to listen. And some of them will listen to you. You can mentor them and mm -hmm. they become better for it and you become better for it. And I really do like that. Like I said, I did have some that were in their late thirties that, that struggle, boy, they really struggle with the dating thing. And I, you know, and um, it's really unfortunate that they ended up in, in those circumstances because to look at, a woman like my wife and look at the fulfillment she has with all those grandchildren and 
happy to be my number one fan and so supportive. I, I could, she will tell you that there's nothing like that. And when the chips are down, you know, she knows that I'll take care of her. Mm-hmm. So that makes her very happy. Okay, and you're... Mm-hmm. Go ahead. No, it makes me happy too, you know, to be able to mentor uh, women and her as well and take care of them. I like that. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to ask you a question for my personal selfish gain, because to be honest, I think that God knew I couldn't handle too much beauty. So he made sure that I wasn't ex- born exotically gorgeous. Right. However, my daughter what? looking at my, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Huh? Not the cow. <laughs> no, I'm not ugly. I'm not ugly. I'm just, you know, um, you know, you would get offered a beauty contract if you were the top percentage of beauty. You know what I mean? Women that are just strikingly gorgeous. Right. So I saw you in person. Oh, it's not true. I told you guys. <laughs> Thank you. That is so okay. not true. Thank you. I Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Now, come on. Here you are. All right. You're comparing okay. yourself to all those uh, models, right? So I, I look, I'll admit, I honestly think I'm an eight, you know, I really do think that that's what my husband says, but I try to be nice on the platform and say adjustable six because, you know, why not? Um, however, wanted to ask you, because I have a theory that my daughter is going to be orders of magnitude more gorgeous than me. I have seen my husband's pictures from when he was, I think, 24 to 35. The man looked like a Greek God. So how did you uh, guide your daughters, or, or if you only had one, about cheap attention versus attention of quality and how to navigate that and not be insatiable? Okay, so I did not do this alone. Mm-hmm. My daughter was the youngest of, of the four. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess I'll probably get in trouble and tell everybody she's 33 now. But here's, here's the deal. She has older brothers that would screen attention from her. And it would tease the hell out of her. And so she got a thick skin right up front. And yet she's a very, very much a girly girl because so is her mom. And her mom was is very modest and very screening. And I would say conservative. And she was raised Christian. Uh, my wife was. I mean, so was I. But I, just for the record, I am not a Christian. Just mm-hmm. I respect them very much and all of that sort of thing. But it's just my personal thing. But um, she... The wife really had a lot to do with that about how to select for a husband. And it's a lot of the same qualities I just put out there, you know, good provider, but he's also got to, here's the thing. He's got to give you the tingles. Mm -hmm. You'll probably understand exactly what that means, but it's an emotional thing where the level of attraction is so much. You'll want to just, you will pay at your own expense to jump on a flight and go see him. Things like that. I mean, when that's mm-hmm. happening, there is a, there is a level of attraction that will carry you through some hard times. Girls will misread that and they'll end up connecting with you know the criminal alpha guy and really destroying their lives because it feels such like such a strong pull. So you need a balance of both. The wife was really good about that, and she had a girlfriend, and we were really close with them when they were growing up. And the daughter's girlfriend and her had devised a plan. The wife supported to go to college to find husbands. Mm -hmm. So they went not so much to get educated, but they went to find husbands. And um, it kind of worked that way Mm -hmm. uh, for her. She was just on the cusp of it. And uh, as she just graduated, she was becoming a teacher. And uh, she was making 10 times the money working in the service industry at a golf course. Uh, and uh, I'm not exactly sure they met through a friend. She met a man that was, I think eight or nine years older than her, a very, very, uh, uh, well-mannered young man that I would consider a son. And she got married and then she got married to him after a two or three year courtship, the whole thing. And that was really nice to see. And, uh, she did struggle with having children. She did have children uh, 29, I think. Yeah. You know, it was that or a career. She was under tremendous social pressure for career. And you should talk to Missy about it. Her, her sitting her down and kind of explaining about motherhood and, and that she had all the time in the world to pursue a career, but not all the time in the world to pursue a family. And that's just nature. And you ask her today, and she's got two beautiful uh, granddaughters. We do now. She has two daughters. And, uh, She's extremely happy, has a very, very successful husband, and she wouldn't want any other way. And she can't believe that women would come up and not 
get a husband and, and have a family because it's too fulfilling. Is it busy? Yes. Does she complain? Yes. But it's all part of that journey mm -hmm. um, for sure. So I don't think I exclusively did anything other than make a good example of uh, a man that she is responsible and that would be a good provider, but yet also one that would be highly desirable and attractive. And that's her husband in essence. Uh, mm -hmm. He's also traditional. He came to me and asked me for her hand in marriage. <gasps> and I said, well, if I say no, would you respect it? And he just went, I'm like, okay, you're going to get it. You know, I know who you are. It's just, <laughs> you know, just going to play with you a little bit, son. But he's become quite a friend, you know, and I would consider him a son. Uh, so it's definitely, she did a really good job, but she went with the purpose of finding a wealthy husband. Mm -hmm. She did. <laughs> so that's a good news, you know. Why not? An entrepreneur, a business owner, the whole thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm actually very proud of that kid too. He's done mm -hmm. more than I have. Oh, wow. Good for you guys. You know, um, cause I get asked this question sometimes, like, why do you make social media content creation if you don't have to work? And it's because when I look at dollars, I look at squishy baby toes and I think about how I can convert the dollars into squishy baby toes. And I want as many in my life as possible. And Look, you can raise children on a budget, but some things just cost. Some priceless memories just cost like traveling or swimming with dolphins. So I was always going to figure out some kind of side hustle because it's true. Life is a little bit better that way. Okay. Um, thank so you, so you were it. just like my wife in that. You know, when I learned how to draw and I started producing these pieces of art that went on shirts and, and different uh, things and I started a business in 1999 on eBay. I turned it over. My wife wanted to work and she had that same vision. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to have to work in the regular office world, but mm -hmm. she had flexible hours and she made it very successful, just like you doing this. And she enjoyed it mm -hmm. and she fitted in with the family and she actually turned it into another business. She did a little tea party business and some other stuff that was really exciting. And then she turned it into a real estate business of, she actually talked me into it, but she started it all while she was raising children, maybe a two or three hour day commitment. And the rest was with the children and that kind of value in a wife, freaking huge. I really wouldn't want a wife that's working, you know, a nine to five and mm -hmm. she didn't want to do that. She never had to, she didn't have to do any of those things, but she wanted to. So I think, I think you're real similar in that way. And you've actually done so well in this social media thing. For me, it's just fun. It's kind of become a little bit of a social get together with my guys on Saturday and the real zero guys. I have fun with it, but who knows? I might retire in about three years from my full time, my two full time jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the book is launched and I might, I, I, there's some things I'd love to explore mm -hmm. and see if I can do well with it. Much like you, mm -hmm. maybe we oh, should look at that late night show and do the advice thing. Oh, yeah. Well, my advice is not very good because all, all I know is that I'm running experiments and they're successful. One key thing or experiment that I've been running lately is to be sincere. I really don't think I was taught how to respect a man growing up. I don't think I had that modeled to me except with my grandmother. And so I, I can't explain how to do it. But what I do know is that my husband wakes up in the morning and when he's in the shower is when I start. Well, I mean, it's going to be different now because his schedule is about to change. But um, when I hear him in the shower, this is my mode to start cooking. And I, I started doing this thing. I decorated the whole dining room and I've tried to set up his breakfast perfect. OK, <laughs> it took some time to get here because eventually I got into the swing and I wanted it to be the, the best thing he could wake up to. So then I would make eggs and then meat and then also cook his lunch, pack his lunch. And I would have it all ready on the table with all the different drinks that he likes because he, do, he doesn't want to be simple. OK, he's got to have the milk and he's got to have the Earl Grey tea. They've got to be separate. He's got to have vitamins and he's got to have um, the eggs and the meat and everything there. So and it's surrounded by the beautifully decorated dining room. So I'm just running experiments so right now. Yeah, it's work. It's working. It doesn't, it you doesn't know? go unnoticed. You know, a lot of times mm -hmm. he probably doesn't say much about it, but I guarantee even the smallest things mm -hmm. doesn't go unnoticed. Mm hmm. You know, you yeah. have a wife that's doing things like that. Now, of course, there's bad husbands. You picked good. He notices. He's a detail guy. He notices. I know. Sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's a curse and a blessing, but yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
No, it's a great way to send him out the door, too, because believe it or not, these days, men do talk about how tired they are of some of their wives. And so at least when he talks about me, he doesn't have to say that. And that makes me feel good because I was in the military as well. I know how men talk behind closed doors. Um, now, obviously, it's the happiest. So you, you send him out with that full belly, right? Oh, that's really good. You know, it reminds me of that meme that's been going around quite a bit. You know, make sure <laughs> make make sure your man doesn't leave home hungry because there's a 304 out there with a sandwich. <laughs> no, there really is. <laughs> there know. is. And there's social proof. And who knows? <laughs> one of these little hussies out there could start getting some ideas. Like, no, thank Have you. Have a sandwich. Have a I know. sandwich. <laughs> have a sandwich what is that oh you committed to a woman and you decided to have children interesting because i might also like the same thing get out of here okay we have our uh, two final questions and then we yeah. do we did have a, a five dollar donation to the platform nice. from uh, new soul he says i believe it's a gentleman you shouldn't limit masculinity or femininity to gender it's more healthy if both parties hold both sides instead of expecting another person to bring it um, I, I keep trying to remind people it's about polarity. So it's about being attracted in the long term. If you want to maintain that through the years, you know, over a decade of, of a long term relationship, if you're the woman, you might want to be more on the feminine side. If you're the man, you might want to be more on the masculine side. And that's OK. That's all I'm trying to recommend to people, because there are masculine and feminine feminine qualities within a man and a woman that just happen along the way, like permission to rest when you're sick as a man. That would be a feminine quality where you just, okay, you know, what? I've given up. Uh, I will just lay down. You can bring me all the snacks. So those are some different examples that I could talk about. So interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I will say this because it's an interesting question. I will say mm -hmm. this. If you, and, and I talk a lot about this in the upcoming book, is your identity. When you have really solidified your identity or your archetype it becomes you it's how you dress it's how you have your self-care it's uh how you present yourself this becomes your true authentic self and that masculinity becomes innate it becomes an innate part of you just like femininity would become an innate part of you ali it's your identity and it's it's effortless at that point and that's why some people get really concerned or confused it's like well, how do you have to be this way or that way? It's innate. I don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. My relationship is basically effortless at this point, you know, uh, because uh, we were very secure in our identities. We took the time to build them. And that's what I'd say to a lot of the young gals that have s adopted such a masculine identity and struggle with having relationships. Try adopting a feminine identity. You don't have to give up the things you think you mm -hmm. do to be feminine. You really don't. You might achieve success in a different way maybe not as publicly but it's just as fulfilling if not more fulfilling so yeah i think that there's a need for uh the ladies to learn how to reinvent themselves with the proper identity you mm -hmm. know i think that would be super valuable is to be able to do that we're constantly as men reinventing our identity or honing it or, or shaping it so that we can move throughout our lives and, and shape reality to our will. You know, I think it's a super important thing. I think masculinity is innate to your identity when you actually have it. You're not subjugating it to every popular whim. Oh, they say I should be this way. So I'll be this way. Or, oh, I should be that way. I'll be that way. I think both sexes are very subject to that right now. Mm -hmm. Very wishy-washy yeah. identity. Well, everybody wants to act like, oh, well, if you tell a woman to be feminine and you're trying to put her in a box, it's like, I don't feel like I'm in a box. Feminine women in the chat, do you feel like you're in a box? I feel free. <laughs> okay, our final two questions. Here's the first one from Lou Kaisley, a longtime supporter. Let's give her, give her the applause. She also has her own YouTube channel, so you guys can check nice. her out and subscribe to her. Yes. I'm um, also ageless. I, I think she's told me her age. And I, I still don't really know. Um, <laughs> I can't process it because she's just so beautiful. Yes. So her question for you is, what would be the best advice you would give a 15 to 20 year old young woman about modesty and marriage? Wow. I would certainly need to start way earlier than that because of the exposure today. She already got a mindful of what this is supposed to be about or what it's not. Mm -hmm. um, so it'd be, a, it'd be a tough to give advice other than, you know, really consider what you want in your future and consider it. You need to have some good role models of mothers mothers that are young, mothers that have successful families, 
-hmm. and and make some decisions on what would suit your best interest, what your personality is going to be. I would even say identity. Do you want to be that 19-year-old 304 that's there in Miami on Fresh and Fit? Is that the identity that you want? How long will that last? Um, I'm, I'm not, to each his own. I'm quite libertarian. Like I said, uh, it, it's, I, I'm not a Christian. I don't hold any moral judgment. That's your choice. But you're going to have to do some soul searching at 15 to 20 because there's a lot of influence on you. And here's the thing. At that age, you just, let's be honest, you are now a fertile woman biologically, and you're going to have an extreme amount of male attention. So anything I might say to you, it could easily be discounted because you're getting all the attention that you would ever desire. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I, I watch this with our daughters go through this all the time. They hit that 15 year old mark. Mom, you don't know shit. <laughs> I know everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm as good as any 30 year old. I got it all figured out. Mm -hmm. I got pressed. Everything's working. Men are giving me attention of all ages. And so <laughs> I know what's going on and I'll just make my own decision. <laughs> so, so it's going to be a tough road at 15 to 20 if I'm trying to give advice then I really need to have her mother giving her the example of modesty mm -hmm. etiquette manners really she needs to be in finishing school way before then and that finishing school is her mother's behavior mm -hmm. so it's going to be tough it's going to be tough to give advice I can give it but will they take it that's really the question mm -hmm. I think with girls, you just have to give them a foundation because I think that the world being the way that it is and also that that hubris, I know everything. What could you possibly tell me, you and old cronies? <laughs> yeah. It's encouraged through media mm -hmm. and TV. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think the women that I've noticed who uh, seem to handle the late 20s well, they had a really good foundation to begin with. So they did stray. But then they saw that for what it was because their parents taught them about the world. And then they went right back. They're like, you know what, dad, actually, you were right the whole time. I'm sorry. So I see that happen a lot. So those formative years, it's got to be got to be it. Um, and we have our last question from Lou Casey as well. She says, do you think the lack of masculine men in the Western world is related to the increase in, of single parent households? I think it's a factor, but I think it's, it's more than that. There's been a uh, literally masculine men hold back the flood. Uh, people are going to get me for this of, of, of Marxism, Malthusianism, socialism that mm -hmm. have been devastating. Our, our nature is to rule others. Do as I say, not as I do laws for thee, not for me. This is just how we do it. And I think the decline in masculine men, it's, been done loosely on purpose through academia mm -hmm. uh masculine men resist change and there's massive political change coming there's a huge belief that we're overpopulated we are not even elon musk has recognized this he doesn't have all the same opinions of everybody on the left but there's a huge demographic crash coming we do not have the population support to replace ourselves and we're trying to do it with uh immigrants but this is worldwide and it's influenced by what's gone on in the last 60 years, my age exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, men and women are not having children mm -hmm. and we're at each other's throats. And the lack of masculinity is a big part of that. I mean, you can look at example ex after example of even feminist women as they age, well, who do they find the most attractive and try to put into their lives? The most masculine men. Mm -hmm. And it's contradictory to what they're broadcasting. It's uh, so a lack of masculinity is a really complex issue um, because I think it's a lack of certain behaviors, but uh, there are traits that are in men that are masculine, no matter what, it'll come back very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's just that right now it's, it's become kind of, it's, Hey, it's sign language. We're being shamed at the highest level, not to behave like that. And the, and the end result is we're not having children. And that collapse is potentially really risky to our civilization. Imagine this. Imagine not having enough men being born or even women to maintain the power grid. Oh, yeah. Just imagine we're already having rolling blackouts in California. There is not enough power alignment. In four years, 45% of us will be 65 and older. We can't replace enough of them fast enough. That's an interesting question. We already have these rolling blackouts. People died from this. So what do we do about 
those sort of things when populations start to collapse when the population is old. So masculinity is an interesting, interesting um, thing to talk about. It's neither good nor bad, but you absolutely need it. And it's been designed by, I mean, it fits right in with Griffold's law. Women bred for this masculinity so that they could have civilizations and all of these amenities to be comfortable. You girls made it all. Because if we didn't have to chase you, we wouldn't have to invent all this stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, don't really know how to answer that. It's, it's a very complex issue. Mm -hmm. But single parent households, there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. But yeah, lack of masculine men. I mean, men step up all the time. The problem is, is it's men, it's men that women don't want to be with. It's not, the, they all want the 10, 20%, but mm -hmm. those guys, yeah, they'll drop a kid here or there, but the girls don't want to settle for anything less. Mm -hmm. And then they're being told that they can be the mom and the dad. You go, girl, don't worry about it. And then they, they come across the child that's, crying and you know it'll be okay it'll be okay but really you need to kind of let them figure it out on their own they need a little bit of hardness in order to solidify their own personality identity and, and be able to problem solve you, you know that young men that are from single mother households are more likely to end up in prison than those that are not by a very large margin mm -hmm. so they, it's it's important masculine is important for those young men in single parent households mm-hmm well, a, w a woman cannot teach a young boy everything. I know we keep trying to pretend like we can, but it's it's just not possible. I mean, we don't even emotionally regulate the same. And a lot of the men that I've seen who I regarded to be we, what the mainstream would call it toxic masculinity, but I've always seen it as a man being in his feminine in a rebellious way. He's angry mm. about something. And that has been for men that had a lot more female influence in their lives every time. I mean, it's <laughs> stereotypes exist for a reason. You notice patterns and you notice trends. So I definitely agree with you on that. So I'll uh, offer one piece of advice mm -hmm. on that and then yeah. I'll, I'll let us go. But yeah. one piece of advice on that for the single moms that might be listening or want to give advice on that, do, do yourself a favor and, f and in your social circle, find a man that has a dominant masculine presence about him. And make sure that your child is aware of that and can see that example in some fashion, be it social, through sport, whatever it is, even a small amount. It doesn't have to be all the time and 100% of the time. But that person that we used to have something when I grew up called Big Brothers. But because mm -hmm. of social pressure and all of the sexual innuendo of having these Big Brothers, they used to have this program where any masculine man of any age could volunteer and be what's called a Big Brother. And this program existed when I was young, and it was to ensure that the single mothers uh, would have a masculine man that can influence their child. This is an amazing freaking program. Well, that went the way of the dodo because it didn't really fit in with the modern narrative that you go girl do it all. But it was very influential. I've known men that have grown up and still in contact with their big brothers that influenced their lives in such a positive way, and they didn't have fathers. It originally was invented for mothers that their the fathers were killed in war they were widowed oh huh yeah check it out it's old stuff but hey i'm an old guy no no i think that stuff is so interesting okay so where can the people find you and what can they expect from you moving forward you can also share some closing thoughts if you would like sure well, i really appreciate that i love talking to you i had so much fun with you and tom you mm -hmm. know uh, you can find me on my YouTube channel. It's uh, RP Thorn. If you look far enough back, you might see a familiar face back in the old days when we started the Elders Council. There was this guy, man. He was really cool. He did a couple episodes. You might know him. <laughs> I'll tell but, him. But uh, you can find me on the YouTube channel. Uh, I have a panel show of a bunch of old guys just kind of tongue in cheek, complaining about stuff and laughing about stuff. We just did an episode. We laughed about the alpha, beta, gamma, sigma, delta, omega men and uh, why those classifications uh, exist and, and why they're kind of funny mm -hmm. and why they might be, you know, ego enhancers <laughs> to say the least. We had a lot of fun with it and, and it seemed to be real popular, but you've got that. Occasionally I do something called rites of passage will interview people and talk about their rites of passage in life and what influenced them. I like doing that in the future. I've got uh, the book coming out this summer and I will become more active at that point. I also run something once a month. It's a club for men. It's called the dragons. 
membership and you can access that on the come durable.com. And this is where we actually talk about these issues uncensored. And we actually bring on folks from this sphere. Uh, probably all the names you've heard of come in there in the lecture. And we do that once a month. It's a three hour meeting. So you can also find me there. That's a membership. Very reasonable. It's like 47 a month. And uh, that's really good. And if you want to, I'd appreciate a subscribe and a like over there on my YouTube channel, but I also have something special for everybody. If they really want, they can run over to my rumble channel at RP Thor. And for oh. the next two weeks, you can hear the, the audio of the first chapter of my book coming out this summer, a dominant masculine presence. It will be up for the next two weeks only. And you can at least get a preview of what that's all about. Oh, how exciting. I'm excited for you to become an author. All right. So we will see you guys next time. Make sure you subscribe to his YouTube channel. He's linked in the title. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming on. See you later. Bye.